Today, what I want to talk to you about is some of my group's work using um, X-ray spectroscopic methods to understand energy converting enzymes. So this kind of fits into the general theme of our institute, um, which is the Max Planck for chemical energy conversion. Um, but before I start, I just want to um, thank my team members. I am really privileged to work with a very talented team of postdocs, PhDs, masters, um, technical staff. Um, and this is a rather out of date picture, otherwise we'd be wearing masks. But um, I just want to highlight that um, my group, um, although based in Germany, is incredibly international. Um, and we're not just internationally diverse, but we're also diverse as scientists. So I am a chemist by training, and I, I certainly have chemists in the group, but we also have biologists and physicists and engineers. And I'm just highlighting this because this is something that I like about being part of the XFS community, is that we're a scientifically diverse community. And I think that's what actually makes us as a community able to, to really address challenging questions. And this is one of the things we want to do at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion. Um, we have three different departments there. Um, my department, which focuses mostly on biological catalysis, the department of Robert Schlogel that focuses mostly on heterogeneous catalysis at surfaces, and Walter Leitner's department that focuses more on um, synthetic homogeneous catalysts. But what kind of unites all of us is that we study the same reactions. We look at key reactions in energy research, like breaking the triple bond in nitrogen or water oxidation or CO2 reduction. And we try to understand um, what the sort of common underlying themes are that enable these challenging conversions. I mean, in my group, we also are very interested in um, utilizing and applying X-ray spectroscopic methods to further our understanding. So we work a lot in collaboration with the other departments applying X-ray based methods. But as I indicated today in my talk title, I'm gonna focus mostly on our work on energy converting enzymes. And um, in my department, there are two group leaders who run the uh, biochemistry labs, Laura DeCombs and James Burrell. And um, together um, they actually um, have um, purified and expressed all the, the proteins on this, this slide that we um, study. And you know as spectroscopists, we're, we're hungry for proteins, so special thanks to them for all the efforts they put in to make our spectroscopy possible. But basically, um, the enzymes that we're looking at, they all enable, um, of course separately, different ones, the reactions that I highlighted on the previous slide. So they do challenging um, energy converting reactions, and they do that using active sites that contain earth abundant metals. And so for this reason, they represent sustainable examples of how to do catalysis well. And so in my group, we spend a lot of time trying to focus on these active sites and how these active sites are transformed during the course of catalysis. But I wanna highlight, and this will be a point I get to later in my talk, is even though as spectroscopists were often focused on the active site, the reason that nature does this so well is that these active sites are part of proteins, which are part of larger biological multi-component systems. And so in the end, thinking forward as scientists, we want to really ask not just how we understand the active site, but how do we understand how the entire system couples in order to make these reactions as favorable as possible. Now, the other thing I want to bring up is you can see these different active sites here. Um, the nickel iron site in hydrogenase, um, this complex um, multi-metallic um, iron um, containing site in nitrogenases that can also have a molybdenum and a vanadium in it, um, the, the iron and copper sites of methane monooxygenase, um, and so on. But what I want to point out, um, and it's not um, directly shown on this slide, um, but for many of these, um, there are also iron sulfur clusters involved in the electron transfer chain, or even directly at the active site, which is the case for nitrogenase, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, and also for many classes of hydrogenases. And this is something that my group and I are interested from a very fundamental perspective is understanding uh, the complexity of the electronic structure of these iron sulfur clusters. And this probably has an evolutionary reason even. We know that nature evolves complexity in biological systems and that it goes from very simple, um, even monomeric or dimeric iron sulfur proteins that typically just do electron transfer 
to larger clusters, which eventually incorporate heterometals, or in the case of nitrogenase, incorporate even a carbide together with a heterometal to do more challenging chemistry. And this is a theme that I'm going to get back to later, but um, overall in our research, we're trying to sort of understand um, what are the best tools to understand the complex electronic structure of iron sulfur cluster? And we'll, we'll get to this in the last part of today's talk. But the first part of the talk, um, I'm going to focus on the most um, complex of these clusters, which in many ways has kind of been a, a, an example we keep coming back to because it is such an enigma to understand, and that is nitrogenase. And so um, what I'm showing on this slide is um, nature's machinery for taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and producing bioavailable ammonia. And so this enzyme is responsible for producing about 50% of the bioavailable nitrogen in the world. And of course, the other half of that comes largely from industrial Haber-Bosch processes, which we use to produce fertilizer. But this is clearly an essential process. And for the molybdenum dependent variants of this enzyme, there are also iron and vanadium dependent versions that I won't talk about today. Um, this is the stoichiometry of the reaction. And so what you can see in the reaction is that it's using ATP as the means to provide the energy to drive this reaction. And so it requires two component proteins to carry out this reaction. One is the iron protein. This is the native reductase where ATP hydrolysis actually occurs. Um, and then the catalytic component, which I'm gonna initially focus on. Um, and then after the question and answer, we'll come back to, to the role of the iron protein. But for now, let's just focus on the catalytic part. The catalytic part is this 250 kilodalton protein. Inside of it, we have the two required cofactors of the catalytic protein. These are the P clusters. They're an eight iron cluster, which does electron transfer and the FEMOCO site which is the site where catalysis actually occurs. And for me, an ongoing question um, that we still haven't fully answered is what are the electronic structure properties that enable this catalytic, this to be the catalytic site and this P-cluster site to be just an electron transfer site? So how does this modification of putting in a capping molybdenum together with this homocitrate, putting in a central carbide, what special electronic structure properties does it impart to the site that makes it more than just an electron shuttle. Now to sort of get at these answers, one of the fundamental questions one wants to answer is how does this catalytic site change over the course of the reaction? And for those of you who are looking closely at the stoichiometry, you'll see that this reaction requires actually eight electrons and eight protons to drive the process. And that means you need more than the six electrons and protons you need to produce the two, two molecules of ammonia. You also have obligate H2 production. Um, and what we'd like to know is that each delivery of an electron and proton, that's what each of these E states are, how is the structure actually transformed? So we know we start at a ground state, um, E0, we put in one electron and proton to get to E1, um, and then we have minimally these eight other E states that occur within the catalytic component. And so through the years, we've been interested in, in trying to really define the electronic structure, um, mainly of the catalytic active site FEMOCO. And so not surprisingly, I don't need to tell this audience, X-ray spectroscopy has been our tool of choice. And so we're looking either at um, X-ray absorption, where we're looking at the transitions to unoccupied levels, or we're looking at um, X-ray emission, where we look at the corresponding um, transitions from the filled core orbitals to the core hole we created on the metal. And then we either look at these separately or we combine them in RICS experiments, which I'll talk about later. Um, but it was X-ray emission in this now, I think, pretty well-known valence decor region, where over a decade ago, we used it to actually show that this protein had a central carbide. This was then at the time, the first example of any protein that incorporated carbide. We've since shown how the carbide gets in there biosynthetically, and that it's also in present in other variants of this enzyme. Um, and X-ray spectroscopy um, has kept us busy for almost a decade just to define E0, that first resting state. Um, and I just am listing here all the methods we've used, they've largely been synchrotron-based, um, X-ray absorption, valence emission, um, X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, but we also combine it with MOSFOWER and DFT. And this is sort of the picture that we have arrived at 
um, from a lot of work from a lot of really great team members. And um, one of the things we showed um, now uh, a, a few years ago now is um, that this molybdenum has an unusual molybdenum three configuration and XMCD um, was utilized to support this unusual non-honed configuration that initially came only from theory. Um, but since this time, we've really wanted to focus on how do you go beyond um, the, the ground state? And part of the problem with going beyond the ground state, as you probably saw, is the large number of irons. Um, we, we kind of lose selectivity. And so for this reason, we've been interested in selective selenium incorporation as a means to get more um, insight into the nature of uh, the femocoactosite. And so this is work um, by a previous postdoc in my group, um, Justin Henthorne, uh, together with um, Doug Reese's group at Caltech um, and his PhD student at the time, Renee Arias. Um, and so what Doug and his uh, team had done early on was to show that you could get selective selenium incorporation by putting the uh, protein under turnover in the, in the presence of potassium selenocyanide um, and protons, no nitrogen or acetylene, no native uh, substrate in that sense. And the selenium selectively incorporates into the 2B position. It has the same overall ground state spin from the EPR, and it maintains the same reactivity. So it basically says that the selenium incorporation is a good analog, and it gives us a way to selectively look at the two irons that the selenium is interacting with. When you put this under turnover, the selenium that was in the 2B position migrates roughly 50-50% into the other two bridging positions. So it allows us to take a look at these other two bridge positions. But again, um, the PR remains quanti qualitatively um, similar. Um, and so this gives us a way basically to sort of use the selenium to kind of look around the belt and, and see um, different irons in this actual cluster. We can also then look at a substrate bound um, intermediate. So we can put this under turnover with CO. We can see a characteristic EPR signature that we know is a CO bound form. Um, and what happens in this, and this has also been defined crystallographically, is that the CO goes uniquely into the 2B position, whereas the selenium stay in the 3A and 5A positions. And so this allows us to actually characterize a reduced substrate bound intermediate of FEMOCO, because uh, I should point out that CO can only bind after reduction, right? So this gives us a way to, to also peak at intermediates. And our method of choice is um, selenium herft. So what we do is we look at the selenium um, 1S to 4P transition. Normally, selenium would have no pre-edge for fully reduced selenide, but when it interacts with an open shell iron, which is 3D, we see these pre-edges. And the intensity of these pre-edges are indicative of how much whole character the iron has. So in a simple picture, if the irons are very oxidized, we see a lot of whole character. We see the iron 3-3. As we reduce it, the intensity goes down. And the energy of these pre-edges also um, when aligned to the rising edge, so we can basically use the rising edge as a reflection of the selenium 1S core energy, and easily in the computer then align those edges and see how the D-manifold actually gets pulled down as the iron becomes more oxidized. So in effect, we have intensity and energy um, probes. And so what Justin did was to first synthesize model complexes that look a little bit like FEMOCO that incorporate selenium and to look at different redox levels of this. And what you see is that there are changes actually in the, the pre-edge um, that are consistent with changes in redox. So the most oxidized has the most intense pre-edge, the most reduced has the least intense pre-edge. And if we align the rising edge like we did in the computer, we can also see there's some shifts. The shifts though are smaller than what I showed you in the previous slide. And we surmise that's because the event is delocalized over this large cluster. And chemically that feels intuitive to me. That's what I would expect to see. Um, but we saw something very different when we looked at the protein. So when Justin looked at the protein, what he saw is that incorporation into the 2B versus the 3A and 5A position. And I should point out there's parallel crystallography to look at the incorporation as well as ICPMS of the solution. Um, and when you actually um, 
do all of these correlations and, and, and get the sort of pure deconvoluted spectra, you see that the 2B and, and, and 3A versus 5A positions look nothing alike. It indicates that 2B is bridging ions that are far more oxidized than 3A and 5A. And this sort of counters our intuition of what we would expect in a synthesized cluster. And it suggests that the protein environment is strongly tuning it. And so when we look actually at the crystal structures, what we see is that there's really very asymmetric protein interactions to the femocoactive site, particularly to these different bridging sulfur positions. And these differences um, where we have much more um, hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions to 3A and 5A means we're more likely to stabilize a more reduced iron at these sites and a more oxidized iron at the other site. And this is interesting because it does mean that the protein environment can actually be tuning one face of the, the cluster to react. So then what we did was to look at this reduced substrate bound intermediate that I mentioned. Um, so we can um, bind CO and now look at the, the, the selenium um, 3A and 5A positions again from the selenium herft. Remember to bind CO, I have to reduce the cluster. And what's interesting is upon reduction, the pre-edge goes up. So this means actually these irons in the 3A and 5A position are actually looking more oxidized. That seems counterintuitive, but we believe that this happens because in order to bind CO, these irons need to be more reduced. And so maybe what's happening during turnover is you're getting redox reorganization in the cluster. And maybe the purpose of the carbide is to actually allow for this facile redox reorganization. It's very covalent, and that probably makes it easy to push irons to another phase to allow for that binding. So definitely selenium herft is a great way to, to, to look at this. Um, these are all scanning experiments though, and we um, obviously also like doing X-ray emission. And one experiment that's appealing is, can we think about doing a possible two-color uh, emission looking at selenium and iron? This is an experiment we haven't done yet, I'll say, um, but we just wanted to explore uh, what can we get out of the, the selenium valence emission? Is this going to be a useful tool for us? And here I just wanna comment um, that um, just to give a shout out that there have been really nice demonstrations of doing two color emission in particular um, by um, Ryan Martini and Chris Pollock on, on manganese and iron enzymes. So there's precedence to do this. And I, I think this, this would be a nice experiment. And I do think we'd learn something from the selenium valence decor. And so here, I just wanna point out that when we look at uh, just simple selenium uh, references, just um, elemental selenium or potassium selenocyanide, um, you can see clear differences in the valence to core, and you can also readily predict these as we expect. But what's nicer is when we look at iron sulfur clusters, we actually see um, shifts in, in the, the valence to core upon protonation. These are fictitious. So these, these clusters don't, the, well, the non-protonated ones exist, the protonated ones don't, so we can only do this in the computer. But uh, we believe that, that one of the first steps in the, the cycle actually involves protonation of one of those bridges. And so this could be a way to selectively get at that. Um, but here I just wanna comment briefly um, is that you know, getting to this next step sort of um, in a, a very um, rigorous way is challenging. Um, and it's more challenging than something like Photosystem 2 where you can laser advance it. Because here um, we, rely on the native reductase and basically rapid electron and proton transfer in the native system to have fast turnover. And so the only way to really get these uh, intermediates in later stages is to basically go to much lower electron flux conditions. And by that, I mean, reduce the amount of reductase and increase the amount of catalytic protein. And if we do that, um, we basically can start to 50-50% populate these early states. And the way we follow that is by EPR. Um, I won't go into this in detail because there was a global XAS talk from Casey von Stappen a while ago um, where he went into this work in detail. But here I just wanna point out um, the EPR is really important for us to quantify and get pure XAS spectra. And when we do that, we can clearly show that the molybdenum doesn't change, um, but the iron, one of 15 irons does change. 
um, albeit you need really nice quality data to see that. And when we combine this together with the EXOFs and the DFT, our picture is that the first electron actually goes to an iron. Actually, we believe it goes to an iron on the, the molybdenum side, and we believe one of the bridges becomes protonated. So that's the first um, proton um, and electron transfer step, we believe. But the selenium would be a, a great way to actually hopefully get at that. Um, and so at this point, um, I think I'm at a good point to pause and, and answer any questions. There are a few questions. Um, let's start with uh, Yulia. You have a question? Uh, yes, uh, Serena, thank you. Very nice uh, presentation, very clear. Uh, I have a very general question. Is it known how that carbon gets in? Do you know like biosynthetic pathway for that cluster or any intermediates or anything? Like basically how nature puts single carbon yeah. inside that iron cluster. Yeah, yeah, that is actually known. So there's beautiful work from uh, Marcus Ruby's group at UC Irvine where they've actually shown it's a radical SAM enzyme that actually does the insertion. So the source of the carbon is coming from an S-adenosyl methionine. They can actually C14 label that and trace that in. Um, and so the assembly um, actually first happens between two iron sulfur clusters that get basically fused by this, this carbide. And that happens um, on uh, NIF-B, this radical SAM, and then subsequent um, insertion of the, the molybdenum and homocitrate happens later. But yeah, there, there has been a lot of beautiful uh, biosynthesis work done to, to show that. Okay, Chris, you have a question? Yeah, sure thing. So first of all, thanks, Ray. I love seeing these data. They're always beautiful. But my <laughs> question is about the CO bound to the selenium labeled clusters, yeah. where you see an apparent oxidation of the iron when that happens. And yes. I was just wondering, what extent do you think that that apparent oxidation simply comes from the pi accepting ability of the CO versus like actual electrons sloshing around in that cluster? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess it's, it isn't, it, that's a great question. Um, I just, it, it's kind of interesting to think about how sort of activated that that bridging CO actually is um, and, and how much it's actually going to affect the, the, the two irons in, in the actual bridge, right? Um, so we, we actually haven't looked at that computationally. And, and actually perhaps another aside to mention is I, I think we still don't fully understand the, the relevance of the CO bound crystal structures to what happens with CO binding in solution. This is something to be honest, we're still trying to sort out in detail because I still believe that you don't necessarily need a bridging CO in solution to have the signature low CO EPR signal. Um, I, I think this is something that whether or not the crystal structure 100% represents what we have in solution for the CO species, I would say I'm not 100% convinced yet. That's Lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, baby steps, yeah. T 10 years on the ground state, so you know. <laughs> This will take me to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the answer, Serena. <laughs> All right, Dugan, you had a question? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of baby steps <laughs> and going one bit at a time, obviously it's, it, it's, it's a huge challenge to get uh, to any of the, these early states. And this is sort of, I, I guess I'm just wondering if you or anyone else have been speculating on, you know, possible crazy ways to eventually access the, the much later states? Uh, is, it, is, is this something you have thoughts on? Yeah, so first I should say that the, the EPR community is way ahead of the X-ray spectroscopy community in studying later stage intermediates. And so there's been beautiful work by Brian Hoffman's group looking at later intermediates, in particular the E4 intermediate, where they think there's um, hydride bridges that are forming. Uh, the big problem for X-ray spectroscopists getting to some of these intermediates is the conversions are so low. Um, and so EPR spectroscopists have the advantage that they can look at a relatively minor component as long as it has unique G values and ignore the rest. Sure. Um, and for us, we really can't do much with like sub 10% conversion to intermediates. And so this is one of the major challenges. And I think that what we'll need to do is not look at steady state accumulation, but really get to a point where we can do pre-steady state. And that will mean that we need triggers to actually 
get there, right? To look at these earlier time points. And it, it'll take time, but I think there are many people who are thinking about it. Okay, cool. Very exciting. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going to hold two other questions for another break or the end. You should continue, Serena. Great, thanks. So this section will actually be uh, quite a bit sh shorter, but um, I wanted to keep them in sort of contained stories. So in the previous section, I focused mostly on what's happening in the active site. But at the start of my talk, I alluded to the fact that this is an entire protein system that's all working in concert to actually optimize this. And so you've already seen the catalytic cycle of just the MOFI component. But of course, the iron protein itself also has a cycle that needs to happen. In fact, the cycle needs to happen eight times. So what needs to happen is that this iron protein, it actually needs to bind ATP and then quickly bind to a given E state of the catalytic protein. And since this binding happens eight times, I'm just indicating this as EN. And so then once it binds to the protein, um, the hypothesis is, which is quite interesting, is that electron transfer actually um, first occurs, followed by ATP hydrolysis, inorganic phosphorus release, and then the, one of the hypotheses is that proton transfer only happens on unbinding. Um, whether or not this is the case or whether or not it's a true PCET process, I would say we don't actually know. Um, but one of the things we would very much like to understand is, can we get a hint about these processes and biological energy transduction? And in that sort of vein, is phosphorus emission a way we can follow these transformations of biomolecules? And so this is just a, a short story I wanna tell that's been really nice work from two PhD students. Um, this was joint co-authorship from Zach Mate and Olivia mcubin Stepanek. And they were working together closely with Sergei Peredkov, who um, is the person who actually built uh, the pink beam line at BESI, where all of these experiments were actually done. And before I go into their specific experiments, I wanted to give everyone a little bit of context that you know, phosphorus and particularly organophosphates are incredibly important in biology. Of course, they're components of DNA and RNA, and as I already mentioned, ATP. But what's interesting is that these phosphates are silent um, in the ultraviolet and in the visible. Um, and probably one of the main tools we have to study phosphorus is P31 NMR. But if you look at P31 NMR of proteins, you'll find that um, because of the, the, the lifetime broadening, you normally need to work with sedimented proteins. They have long relaxation times on the order of seconds. And so there's really limitations in terms of how you could use NMR, which makes phosphorus emission potentially even more attractive, especially if you can do it in solution. And I will um, give a, a shout out to um, uh, Petrick and Stein. Um, I know this is at least one paper from Jerry's group. There's, there's certainly been previous phosphorus emission. Um, and I think that just this whole tender X-ray regime it has still a lot of possibilities to offer. But here I just want to point out, if you're looking at a organophosphate, you have a slightly different picture for the valence to core. So um, before I showed you valence to core, for instance, at iron, we were interested in these contributions from the ligand 2S and 2P, which gain intensity from a very small percent of metal P mixing. In contrast, the, the phosphorus emission, especially for um, an organophosphate, is going to be quite intense. So we have these nice dipole allowed transitions where we have 3P character mixed into the oxygen 2P and oxygen 2S levels. And so just to make this nice and clear on a molecular orbital based picture, if I were just to draw tetrahedral phosphate, then I would have my uh, molecular orbitals that transform as T2 all transform as the same um, symmetry as the dipole operator and they give us lots of intensity in particularly those that are sigma interacting. So we nicely see the sigma interacting um, set of oxygen 2Ps giving us this blue line, and then the sigma interacting um, set of oxygen 2Ss giving rise to this red feature. And then of course what happens as we lower symmetry and we go from tetrahedral to C3V when we singly protonate to C2V when we doubly protonate, we lose the degeneracy of these T2 sets 
And that manifests in these low energy shoulders um, to the low energy side of the oxygen 2P and 2S. And so this certainly highlights that, um, again, something that was shown also in the early Petrick papers that we have sensitivity to changes that occur at the phosphate. But when we look at these biomolecules, it's interesting to ask how sensitive might we be? And here I was actually somewhat surprised to see, um, there are actually quite pronounced differences between AMP, ADP, and ATP. I'm showing just the, the spectra on the, the solid complexes here and those, the corresponding um, calculations below. The different spectra um, are basically just the spectra with ATP subtracted. So the ATP is obviously the flat line, and then you can just see the different spectra. And I just wanted to highlight that though the changes are small, um, we can at least pick up the trends computationally. And then we wanted to ask, can we do this in solution? And then of course in solution, we're not just looking at the difference between ATP and ADP, but inorganic phosphate will also be present. And so we can simulate that and basically show um, that we still actually expect to see some changes between these two limits. Um, and so this is, I think, promising that, that that non-resonance phosphorus emission should be sufficiently sensitive. You'll notice though, we're pretty high concentrations. And I just wanna point out, we were doing this um, well, not in optimal condition. So pink was in a commissioning mode. We had only one crystal. And I, I do think we can, we can probably go to much lower concentrations than what we were doing here. The other beautiful thing though that, um, Zach and Olivia were able to show is that they could even see changes between NADP and NADPH. And so this is um, a, a process that often drives many redox processes and enzymes. And what's amazing is these are differences that are even remote from the actual phosphates. And so it really shows that there's some contribution even from non-covalent interactions in the environment that are influencing these spectra, um, both in the solid state and in the solution. And so we do believe that this could have perhaps broader applicability outside of just nitrogenase, but to, to enzymes in general. And so I'm gonna go back to that same multicolor sort of figure that I showed you before and, and now put my, my SAC spectrometer here and show you my, my dream experiment would be that you watch all of this in concert. Now there's a million problems with this. Obviously the phosphorus has no cross section at the energy I wanna do my SACs and things like that, but but one can dream. And so um, this is kind of just what I'm thinking and I wanted to, to share some, some recent results and I will pause again for questions before we get to the RICs. I guess just a, a brief comment in that Stein paper, one of the interesting things is we did a head-to-head -head comparison between um, the 31 phosphorus NMR and the phosphorus K-alpha uh, benchtop spectroscopy. And the, 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 the K-alpha spectroscopy just won in terms of needing less material and much faster measurement time. So yeah, I, yeah, I, think, I think it's, it's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, analytical tool, the phosphorus spectroscopy. Yeah, Julia, I, do, I, you, I, do you have a, yes, sorry, uh, oh, go ahead, Serena. Am I allowed one more question? Uh, so actually it comes for the first part, uh, back to um, uh, nitrogenase, um, Serena, can one do cyclic voltometry? Do you know like redox potentials of those, you know, eight or whatever transitions is needed? Uh, um, or it's uh, never been possible to put this on electrode and know the redox potential of those transitions? Uh, so, yes, um, the, I think the big problem is that um, the electron transfer process is gated. So the presence of the iron protein is actually uh, generally thought to change the redox potentials within the catalytic protein. And um, Akif Tescan actually has a really nice ChemRev that actually reports those redox potentials as a function of um, different conditions. But yes, they, they are known and people have actually, um, uh, us included recently, put these on electrodes um, to try to drive it in the absence of the iron protein. And it's something we and others are working on. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that might be interesting direction. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, but Jerry, back to your uh, your comment. I um, I actually, I really enjoyed the Stein paper. I, it's obviously it was more um, on a, a, a little bit outside of the biomolecule side of things, but I, I still think that the, the whole utility relative to uh, phosphorus 31 NMR, you guys definitely nicely showed that, so. 
You should continue, Serena. We got some questions for the end, but no questions right now. Okay, sorry. I will go ahead then. Um, I'm going to come back to the, the slide where I talked about um, sort of one of my pet questions, I guess, this question of the evolution of complexity and how do we probe the electronic structure um, better than we, we can now. And in my view, we, we need better spectroscopy to do that, but we also need improvements in theory. And so I just wanna put this in context and basically highlight the fact that iron sulfur clusters are probably, at least in terms of um, biological cofactors, they're one of the most, or they are the most challenging cofactors to treat computationally. And so most of the time we treat these, even an iron sulfur dimer, um, we're, we're challenged to get it right. And so in DFT methods, we treat this using a canonical Heisenberg double exchange model, um, where we basically have a um, exchange term J and a double exchange term B. And this exchange term B allows for interaction just between a pa pair of D orbitals. Um, and it assumes that the rest of the D orbitals are sufficiently well separated that they don't make the picture too complicated. Um, and so this basically um, predicts just two low-lying excited states for a mixed valent iron 2-3 pair. But if you go to wave function-based ab initio calculations where you more rigorously treat this and you allow all the D orbitals to interact, which frankly, given the tetrahedral ligand fields, makes more sense, they're unlikely to be so separated. Um, you actually have a very dense manifold of low-lying excited states. So an, an order of magnitude more states in this low-lying so-called spin ladder than you predict in a Heisenberg double exchange model. And so one of the questions we've been interested in is just how do you get at that? And one of the challenges, of course, in getting at the answers to that is that many of these transitions are parity forbidden and or spin forbidden. And so for this reason, um, we've been pursuing 2P 3D RICs as a means to get at this question. And of course, um, this is um, work of Anselm Han, who was a former PhD student now at Tussenkrupp, and Ben van Koyken, who's now an instrument scientist at the European XFEL. And what they did was to look at iron L edge 2P 3D X ray absorption followed by emission. Um, and of course, if this emission returns to a same configuration as the ground state, then you just get an elastic line at zero energy transfer. But if this corresponds to a DD excited state, you start to see things on the energy transfer axis. And because of two P spin orbit coupling in the intermediate state, this allows us to have a mechanism to see spin forbidden transitions via two dipole allowed transitions, which is quite nice. Now, just to show that that works the way we think it should, I'm showing here just the 2P 3D RICs, just a cut through the RICs plane of a high spin ferric iron three. For convenience, I put a Tanabe Sagano diagram here for people who don't remember them. And just remember that high spin iron three has a sextet ground state. So by definition, all of the high lying DD states are all of a different spin multiplicity. They're all spin forbidden. And that means all of these are spin forbidden states that we're actually seeing, which is quite beautiful. If we then reduce it and just go to the D6 octahedral, um, what we then predict is a low lying uh, spin allowed quintet to quintet transition. And that's actually what we see here in the blue. And then everything to higher energy is the spin forbidden transitions. And I won't go through this in detail. This is something that was published um, five years ago now, but I'm just highlighting the fact that in principle, you can extract all the ligand field parameters and really get the energetics of all these DD excited states provided you have sufficient resolution. What happens though when we go to iron sulfur clusters? Um, here, what you can see is that we can see a difference between an iron two, iron three dimer and an iron three, three dimer. But unlike what we saw for the chlorides, we basically see these bands. Um, and in some sense, this is consistent with what we see from theory. We expect a dense spin ladder, but um, we don't have the experimental resolution to separate this out. And we've kind of been challenged on pushing this forward to proteins because the other challenge we have with most 2P3D Rick's beam lines is that 
in order to get good resolution, they tend to have very focused beams that obliterate our samples. So even for our model complexes, we have to constantly move them. And we haven't really been successful in, in our attempts at, at actual proteins. Um, and so one of the things we're kind of getting excited about are, are thinking about using transition edge sensor detectors. Um, the resolution on some of these are improving and the ability to defocus the beam um, and have a larger solid angle might make this amenable. But um, for now, we kind of turned our attention back to, well, if we can't get it from 2P 3D RICs, what else can we learn maybe from 1S 3P RICs? And so for this part, I just want to turn back briefly to non-resonant K-beta mainlines just to give you a reminder of the kind of information that you're getting out of this. I know probably most of you are quite familiar, but this is just a reminder that we have these well-known fingerprints for high spin and low spin ferret complexes, for instance, uh, where you see a greater separation in the high spin case than the low spin case. And this is something that Tatsumi first showed in the 1950s. And these days there's numerous examples in the literature where we can look at high spin iron three, regardless of the ligand, it has a fingerprint and low spin has a distinct fingerprint. Now, just briefly to remind you of where this comes from, um, these of course, uh, in the high spin case, we have a, a sextet S ground state. We ionize either an alpha or beta electron to get to septet and quintet intermediate states that then relax to quintet and septet P final states. Of course, if that were the entire picture, we would have two, P, two features um, in a five to seven ratio split by the 3P3D exchange. But of course, as you know, the picture is somewhat more complicated than that because we have other low-lying DD excited states that can make contributions. And the way that manifests is that different parent terms contribute to this and that the final spectrum looks something like this, right? And this is just a simple hand kind of calculation and we can do the same thing in the low spin case, right? And so if you were going to work all of this out on paper, you could also then, um, go through your multiplet analysis and um, figure out then what the energy splitting should be in the main line. But as Chris Pollock showed, who's, who's in the audience, um, if you look at these main lines actually as a function of ligand identity, the, the splitting can actually change dramatically even when everything is, is five halves. And what Chris together with Mario Delgado and Mikhail Atanasov showed is that these exchange terms need to be modulated by covalency. And when we become more and more covalent, basically um, we're, we're off this simple fingerprint picture. It doesn't work anymore. Um, and we could in fact get the redox level wrong um, if changes in oxidation state and covalency cancel. And so what Chris um, showed some time ago has been very helpful for us because what we realized is when we compare um, iron, in the same environment, so this is the same exact model where we have a diferous, a mixed valent, a diferic, and the K-beta mainlines are fully superimposable. And one could say, oh, maybe they're all photoreduced or whatever, but we actually have um, Mossbauer on these samples that differ, we have valence decor that differs, we have zanes that differ, um, but it kind of is a cautionary note um, in terms of using the K-beta mainlines as a reporter for oxidation state. Now, Sometimes some of my physicist friends like to tell me, you chemists, you care so much about oxidation state. This just shows you it's meaningless. And of course, for me, I don't like that answer because it's fundamental to our mechanisms, like how we think about these iron sulfur clusters, they, they need to be changing redox. And so the question I had is, is this picture true or, or can we recover information by going resonant? And so um, this is work of Rebecca Gomez Castillo, a, a previous PhD student who is now doing her postdoc at the EPFL with Mahed Shirgui. And what Rebecca nicely showed is just taking simple, again, um, ferrous and ferric tetrachloride. If you do the non-resonant emission and take the different spectra, you get this fairly flat line here. But if you go resonant, so by that I mean into the pre-edge, so you do a 1s to 3d resident excitation followed by the 3p to 1s decay, you recover dramatic differences. Um, and I won't go through the, the mechanism of this, but I'm happy to, to discuss it if anyone is interested. But of course, just in a simple picture, this arises from the fact that 
when I have, for instance, a final D7 configuration, I have intrinsically different multiplets. I have a quartet F ground state term. And anytime you have an F ground state term, um, by symmetry, you basically enable CI between other low-lying excited states, which increases the complexity of the multiplet structure. And so to me, this is a really cool way to recover electronic information that you maybe thought you lost. And Rebecca did this, of course, just by doing resonance at the pre-edge. She also um, has since looked at entire RICS planes where we can get even more information, but I, I won't be talking about that today. I just wanted to highlight that you can make these generalizations for really any DN count and really um, recover information that looks like it's lost. The other thing I wanted to point out is, Rebecca, um, this needs to be updated because it can't be ASAP from last year. Sorry about that. Um, but. What Rebecca also did was to apply this to iron sulfur clusters and show again, things that had no changes recovered in the resonance emission. And in fact, she even applied this to nitrogenase. And so we're hopeful that this is a way for us to kind of take this a step forward and enhance our ability to basically get more detailed information about these. Um, and so with that, I'm actually already at the, the end of my talk. I, I hope that I've shown you that um, Selenium Herft gives us um, a, a nice way to get more localized electronic structural information if we can incorporate it into the clusters. I believe both selenium and phosphorus valence to core XCS are sort of promising directions for, for studying in particular nitrogenase, but I think probably also other processes in, in biological energy transduction. And I've given you just a little teaser at the end about the kind of information we can get out of 2P3D and 1S3P RICs. Um, I've tried to give shout outs to all of my group members throughout the talk, so I will um, just once again thank them for all of their contributions, um, thank the, the funding agencies and all the synchrotrons and um, you for your attention. Wonderful talk, Serena. Uh, we'll start off with Matthew Marcus had a question. Yeah, so I was wondering, you know, these new clusters and their enzymes are so complex, I was wondering how they evolved. And uh, from what the you know what the simpler precursors were and how they got to where they are now, and I've heard a, a, of a theory that says that, uh, that one of the precursors uh, might have been mineral surfaces like iron sulfur minerals have some similar local structures. Yes, so there actually is um, um, a Max Planck Institute that's actually um, for terrestrial microbiology that completely studies these processes. So this was kind of some of the early work of, um, of Tower. And yeah, it is believed that they, they come from, from iron sulfur containing minerals. Um, but I have to, to say in terms of that early part of the process, I, I, I can't can't tell you much more than I think you you sound like you already know. <laughs> yeah, but because it's really quite amazing that they, they, not only do you have these very complicated clusters, some with rare elements like molybdenum, but also you have uh, the enzymes that synthesize them. And so something yeah. has to code for those, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and the, and the coding is also very complex. I mean, I think that's what's interesting is that um, for instance, in these nitrogenases, many organisms have um, the ability to, to produce many different kinds of nitrogenases. And basically, the, the genes that get turned on depend on the metals that are available in their environment. Um, and so, for instance, as long as they have molybdenum, they'll produce the molybdenum-dependent forms, and those are by far the most efficient. But depleted of molybdenum, they can start producing alternative nitrogenases. Um, and so it it's amazingly uh, complex and fascinating that it's it's beyond my my microbiology knowledge. I must confess. Thank you. Okay, John Vinson, you had a question about selenium. Yeah, this was back from the first part. Um, so you showed that they're very different uh, HERFD for the different selenium sites, and I was curious if there were. Uh, differences in the coordination beyond the two. I mean, they all have the two iron neighbors, but if there are um, strong differences in like the hydrogen bonding or something. Uh, yes, that, that, so that actually is um, what I, I can maybe, I don't know how quickly I can go back to that slide because I don't remember the slide number. So I'm taking you back there manually. But yeah, we um, do believe that there are differences in the, um, so this is basically from the crystal structure. Okay, yeah. so, so we do think it's these, these differences in the number of hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions that are um, probably influencing how 
um, the, the distribution of redox states actually localizes. So the experiment I would love to do, because we can actually extract this cofactor into organic solvent, um, is, is to look at the cofactor once it's extracted. But these experiments to do the selenium enrichment are so painful that nobody in my group signs up to do it. So, <laughs> but yeah, it, it would be a cool experiment. Um, and I keep trying to convince someone they want to do it. Yeah, so I guess I was wondering if um, if the changes in the in the coordination is also affecting the, the shape of the XAS in addition to the, the neighboring charge state. Um, so we, we think that it's like just in terms of direct coordination, no. We think it's just really modulations due to, to electrostatics and hydrogen bonding, but the, the direct coordination is, is effectively the same. And keep in mind with protein crystallography, this can also be, uh, you know, some of these differences could be within the, the air also. Okay. All right. Next question is from Jack Burke about the RICs. Hi, um, this resonant scattering work is really interesting. And you showed how you can use it to access ligand field excited states of transition metal complexes. Uh, my question is just in, in general, if you have a mixed valence system with very strong electronic coupling, do you think it would be possible to access the metal to metal charge transfer state as the final state in the RICS transition? Um, that's a Good question. I mean, we certainly see contributions from charge transfer states in the RICs, but I think that um, as you saw, these, these spectra, as they get very covalent, the, the charge transfer contributions become very, very broad. And that's a part that we're also not that good at modeling theoretically. Um, so, I mean, still to date, like most of the advances in theories have focused on getting the DDs correct. Um, still charge transfer tends to be modeled through these uh, multiplet plus VBCI type models, which tend to be rather empirical. So I think with the charge transfer states, to be completely honest, I'm often not sure exactly what I'm looking at. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. We wandered into one of the two questions I wanted to ask which was um, uh, you had a bunch of slides where you showed experiments you're doing and new experiments you want to be able to do. Yeah. Um, uh, the question I was going to ask is, okay, what about theory? Um, is there an aspect of theory that's slowing down progress with these methodologies? And it sounds like a need for first principles multiplet or something like that would be one yeah. possible answer. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, the, I think there, there definitely are... Uh, Right now, we, we mostly use multiplet-based interpretations for our RICs. Um, one can do this with CAS SCF and NUF PD2 calculations, um, but they're, they're challenging calculations. And um, so far, using it in any routine way hasn't been that accessible. So we mostly use wave function-based methods to get energies of where we expect states, but getting correct intensities has also still not been so great. I would assume if we could do like a CAS SCF uh, NEF PD2 calculation with a large enough active space, in principle, you should get the charge transfer correct. But um, so far, we're still- Sounds hard. I think, so, so far, I would say Frank Nase's group is still working on that. And, okay. and where the experimentalists going, that doesn't look like our spectrum. <laughs> 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 so yeah. Very good. Okay, and the last question is, um, uh, how has the study of the, uh, the evolved metal center catalytic process, how has that informed people who are trying to make synthetic metal center catalytic uh, uh, processes? In, in terms of nitrogenase specifically, or? As you, as you wish. We'll make it a broad ending question. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, it's actually an, an excellent question because I think that the lessons that we actually um, take from uh, biological centers tend to be rather indirect, right? I mean, I think that one thing we've learned is that simply mimicking the active site is not very helpful, right? And so I think this is actually why we see more and more people looking at how is the protein environment tuning it? How is electron and proton transfer actually done in a um, controlled way? Because so often people can make models that look just like the active site and do nothing, right? Do nothing, and so yes. 
Yeah, so I, I think this is why as a community, we're, we're starting to realize um, what we need to understand is, is far bigger than the active site. And, and I think that's not just the metalloenzyme community, but also the catalysis community. When you think about what happens on a reactor, it's not about an active site alone. It's about the entire sort of reactor and how things change in a macro scale way. And so I think that um, all of us will have to start broadening our thinking beyond the, the active site. And for us, I think too often the, the models have provided more, more spectroscopic signatures than actual catalysis one-to-one uh, -one mapping. Yeah. Got it. We do have one last question from Yulia. Yulia, please. Yeah, I think it's a kind of um, combines few last questions in one. So we talked about computation, we talked about models, and we have this beautiful slide still up. Uh, Serena, from calculation standpoint, uh, is there any mechanistic proposal, let's say, where nitrogen should bind and any kind of independent from spectroscopy computational work for this system? Yes, there's quite a bit. So um, there are many the theory groups that are very active and um, the primary spectroscopy they're coupling to is, is some of the EPR and Endor work from Brian Hoffman. And so that proposal largely has um, the binding um, occurring at this F, uh, this iron 2-6 phase. So this would be the, the side that people believe that, that nitrogen probably comes in and binds um, and that there also needs to be, um, there's a lot of debate, but a lot of people argue that you get protonation of this um, sulfide bridge, that it either swings out. Some people argue that it needs to be completely labelized um, because that's what they see in much of the crystallography. Um, so we, we don't know if this bridge is here, but we believe that, that N2 actually is initially binding here. There are hydride bridges that then actually protonate the, the nitrogen in, in a, a, a reductive elimination um, mechanism that, that releases that initial hydrogen. So yeah, there, there are certainly proposals, but yeah. Thank you. Very nice talk, thanks. Yeah, thanks. And with that, everyone should please thank Serena as a terrific talk. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.